Good morning, everyone. Uh, I think uh, as, as we move into the second half or, or final third of the, the summit, it's, uh, I think we can all reflect on a, a tremendous amount of learning. And each summit, uh, New Cities Foundation Summit, really just does get better and better in terms of uh, the learning opportunities for everyone. I want to uh, start this session with a, a show of hands. Who is from a secondary city, sometimes known as a second tier city, or, or a place that you think is? And I wonder if we were to go around and, and do a data gathering exercise, what the size of those cities would be. Because the, the, um, the, the scale, the population scale, and the t geographic scale of a secondary city in one part of the world, such as North America, may be quite a bit smaller uh, than a secondary city in, uh, in Asia. I am from a secondary city that most of you have probably never heard of, uh, Kanpur, India. It has only six million people. Why would it even figure on an Asian map, right? And indeed, it's not a very prominent city. It is, however, a major city in a province, Uttar Pradesh, which is the most populous. And we talk about Indonesia as being a large emerging market with a large population. Well, as Ajit knows, uh, Uttar Pradesh has a population of 300 million people. So I come from a secondary city in a, in a, in a simple, humble province, but of 300 million people. So, Secondary cities really have uh, quite a, a wide margin of, uh, of, of size that we could be dealing with. And this is the new cities foundation. It's not just the new mega cities foundation. So I think this is a, a tremendously important topic for us to have uh, to introduce uh, to, uh, to the content here. Imagine a world in which there were only major airport hubs, only Chicago and Heathrow and Dubai and Singapore, but none of the other airports. Right? Wouldn't it be a lot harder to get around the world? Wouldn't it be tremendously more inconvenient? Would that be an efficient world? No. So just as we cannot imagine uh, expanding the scale of transportation infrastructure to include all of our regional hubs and smaller uh, airports that allow us to connect around the world, so too should we not be neglecting the secondary cities that are the uh, subject of this conversation uh, this morning. And we heard earlier that uh, secondary cities of, uh, of that middle sort of uh, population size are not only potentially the optimal size for, uh, econ for sustainable economic growth uh, beyond which uh, uh, generating more productivity becomes harder, so above the four million uh, population, but also there's a lot of research that shows that this, this tier of secondary cities around the world is going to be responsible for one third of total global growth moving forward. Mega cities, another third, and uh, Western economies, another third. So this is an incredibly important tier of the world economy that we are talking about when we talk about these distributed uh, mega cities. And they have all of the same problems, of course, as uh, some of, uh, of the major cities that we've been talking about. Issues about around the quality of infrastructure, issues around the, uh, the um, volume of, uh, of connectivity for citizens and residents and delivery of services, and of course, um, education, skills, labor productivity. Uh, when we measure labor productivity in cities around the world, we find that there is always a very big drop off between the uh, economic performance and the quality of the labor pool in the major cities uh, versus the secondary cities and beyond. How do we correct to that. That's also one of the main priorities. So joining um, us this morning are three incredibly distinguished uh, panelists and, and speakers representing three different countries that are at three different stages of the arc of development uh, in the secondary city uh, phenomenon. Uh, immediately to my left, uh, Ajit Gulabjan, the great friend of the New Cities Foundation, who is the uh, chairman uh, and managing director of Hindustan Construction Company. Uh, to his left, um, Mohammed Ramdan Pomanto, the mayor of the great city of Makassar. We are going to be calling him, this is in the, uh, in the wonderful tradition of, um, uh, of the, the laid back culture of Indonesia that we are, we are going to call him Mayor Danny today. He goes by Mayor Danny. And, uh, and to his left, uh, Mr. Li Tia, the director general of the China Center for Urban Development. So please join me in welcoming our, uh, our panelists this morning. Um, we're going to start with Mayor Denny. Uh, you are from uh, a city with a great history, in fact, of connectivity, of uh, involvement in, in global trade dating back centuries, even to the spice trade and so forth. Today, however, 
given the uh, overwhelming size and scale of the Indonesian state, you are one of uh, several, uh, you know, major but but uh, but secondary uh, cities, and you are of course um, in uh, in a, in a island province. Uh, so, how do you compete to get the uh, attention that you need from the central government, uh, the resources, the investment uh, to be prioritized in order to meet your own local needs for growth? I would like you. Uh, I would like to introduce my city. Makassar is the center point of Indonesia. If you live in Makassar, you can uh, go anywhere in Indonesia at the same time. It's very good positioning. And um, Makassar is the, one of the big five cities in Indonesia. Makassar is the hub of Eastern Indonesia. And now Ma Makassar population is 1.8. Eight million people, and um, the economic growth is uh, the highest economic growth in Indonesia. Last year, uh, our economic growth is uh, 9.23 uh, percent, and now uh, the big problem is uh, the infra infrastructure. The development to infra infrastructure is not, not it cannot follow the economic growth. Now, infrastructure from the central government. I think uh, uh, what uh, the Makassar needs uh, uh, support from the central government is about the infrastructure. Infrastructure and uh, uh, from investment, yeah, can the, uh, by the loan or the PPP. Uh, I hope uh, the next year, in the future, uh, uh, the central government can uh, give the authority policies about uh, this infestation for uh, our city. Because uh, maybe a friend from the foreign uh, uh, want to invest in Makassar, but uh, uh, our problem is about the uh, bureaucracy, the three authority about the central government, province government, and uh, local government. Mm -hmm. I'm going to turn to uh, to Mr. Lee because uh, China is in so many ways considered to be a role model in harnessing this demographic size of secondary cities, uh, often by clustering them. And China has been the most rapid in redesigning uh, and reorganizing uh, uh, political space to cluster cities together to leverage their collective uh, scale and to build infrastructure to connect them. Uh, can you reflect on this strategy, but also tell us what is next for China? What are the, the geographies of the secondary cities that are the new priorities for the government? Actually, we also have basic problems. Can you hear me? Okay. Yeah. Actually, we also have problems with subsidiary cities in China. Uh, mm. and, and, and actually, in China itself, uh, because we're also facing a big problem of the uh, uh, enhancements of or, or the progress of um, urbanization, so we have almost uh, around uh, 20 million people coming into the city uh, each year. So this is our biggest problem too. So actually right now we also have uh, five mega cities in China. So these uh, big or mega cities uh, are facing a lot of uh, management and control problem for the population because we have run almost 20 million pro uh, populations from the rural area who's going to the urban area. So this is uh, the main concern for our government policy, how to manage and control the urbanization. Uh, 
能就引起到了面临严重的挑战。所以城市的基础设施供给呢，相当不足。嗯，老陈教授，一千一千三百万人口，万人口一千万。一千三百万人口，啊，外来人口。一千万。一千万。嗯。上海两千三百万人口，嗯，外来人口九百万。九百万。Okay. And for example, oh, we have uh, uh, two big cities in China among those five big cities, for example, Sunchen and Shanghai. In Sunchen, actually, we only have a population of 13 million, but we have population coming from all over of the other cities surrounding Sunchen around 10 million. And in Shanghai, uh, we have a population of uh, 20 million currently, but we have population coming commuters from other cities around uh, 9 million. So uh, these big cities are also uh, facing a lot of problems. Uh, what kind of policy should we actually organize to manage and control uh, the coming flow of urban population. So, the Chinese government in the previous year in the Xinjiang Urbanization Act, they proposed to encourage small cities, which is what we today talked about, small urban development. Okay, so our central government currently actually we have made a lot of new regulations and policies to actually uh, uh, support a lot of these uh, subsidiary cities or small cities to develop their own cities so uh, people from the rural area will not be coming to our big cities. Because if we actually discuss this about subsidiary cities uh, in China, uh, the thing is because subsidiary cities itself have different standards around the world. Uh, usually, uh, the international standards is maybe probably uh, resident population around 500 uh, million until uh, oh, sorry, 500,000 till 1 million. Uh, but in China itself, actually, we already have a lot of uh, 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 subsidiary cities or uh, medium-sized uh, cities. Uh, population between 500,000 till 1 million is around 136 uh, cities in China with that population. And then we have 434 cities in China with a population which is less than 500,000. Uh, so uh, currently, we already have uh, around um, 670 uh, uh, cities, which is actually have population uh, around 500,000 to 1 million. So, uh, so, uh, for actually the next development of this uh, 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 subsidiary cities in China, we have uh, three priorities. The first priority is uh, about the development of infrastructure, and then the ter uh, second is how to manage the uh, big flow of uh, population coming down to the city, and the third will be connectivities uh, between cities. So uh, to actually solve the uh, infrastructure uh, problem previously, uh, the government will uh, go through to the management of uh, uh, land and property. Uh, but how, uh, however, uh, currently the government have put a new regulation to put a lot of financial resources for the infrastructure from the central government to the uh, uh, city's government. Thank you. The uh, second question is to the control the now all the have a and uh, the second, actually, uh, previously we have a very tight regulation regarding uh, uh, identity management, uh, especially in the uh, mega cities. Uh, so uh, currently, we're actually being more flexible in terms of urban population uh, coming down. The third is to 
就是所有五十万人口以上的城市，等于所有的中等城市要高铁要通。And the third regarding connectivity is our government, all, government also have uh, uh, actually new uh, policies to increase the connectivities between cities. We have instructed uh, cities would have a population around 500,000 uh, have to mandatory have a very good public uh, transportation uh, inside their cities. Uh, so uh, hence, actually, uh, the problem afterwards, after we actually uh, build enough infrastructure and uh, population control management and also connectivities within the cities, the next challenges will be uh, investment, industrialization, and also how to actually change uh, the industrialist uh, people who's uh, used to industrialization to be uh, customized with the service industry. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, if Indonesia is a country now that uh, where the secondary cities are awaiting uh, you know, more government investment, China is a place where the government has driven uh, that investment. India is somewhere in between. Uh, uh, so much of the burden of, uh, of urban development, of infrastructure, has fallen on the shoulders of the, the private sector. But now, that is, of course, starting to change uh, under the new leadership in India and the prioritization of uh, sort of strategic urbanization, I think one w could call uh, uh, the strategy right now. So Ajit, maybe you could fill us in a bit on how this applies to the secondary cities. And I should add that India, like China, is a country where the expectation that middle-tier, middle middle-sized middle cities would be a major driver of the consumption class, the consuming class, the connected class, has been very, very high. But in India, the, the lack of infrastructure uh, and also some of the economic volatility has made it difficult for, uh, for, for even you know, new migrants into secondary cities to really um, fulfill their sort of urban uh, ambitions. So if you could kind of give us an update on where things stand across India, that would be great. I think first we need to understand what is precisely happening in order to address this very question. We are talking about a migration of about 2.5 billion or 2.3, whatever, depending on the expert. But about 400 million out of that is going to happen in India from rural areas to cities. Now, when we talk of this migration of this volume, and it is going to happen in the next 30 to 40 years, which is the speed with which it is happening, good part of the developed world had this kind of migration happen over 2,000 years. So when we look at this, we must keep this in mind that when it comes to, therefore, urbanization or creating cities, mega cities, medium-sized cities, or small cities, I think this is going to happen. If it does not happen by a planned way, it is going to happen through the organic way in which people come into the city, set up their homes in and create what we now call slums, and they start operating in that city. And over a period of time, these slums start improving as the city's prosperity comes through. So the natural migration and the speed with which it is coming, we have no choice but to also look at how these second tier cities will also have economies. Because migration takes place where there are jobs where the life is a little better. Mm -hmm. In India, what had happened so far is that because go good part of the, the, the country came from the rural sector, all attention was paid to the rural sector, and the village was considerably romanticized. And yet, in reality, all the people from the r r villages wanted to move over to, to the cities because the life in the cities was, even the worst life in the city was far better than any life in the village. Second important thing here happened is that because of this rural bias, a lot of government policies of financing, subsidies, etc., were more rural based. So even though there are many small towns which qualify for being urban, 
Nobody wants to call them urban because all the subsidy and the money comes to rural areas. So they prefer to continue to call mm -hmm. themselves rural. Mm -hmm. So some of these distortions caused by government policy of, of, of another era where you kept romanticizing the rural area because the votes came, you kept on pouring money there, has prevented urbanization in India. It's the first time that this, the a government of India has recognized that urbanization is essential, like what China did s s two decades ago. And therefore, we are now started looking at the policies that will make all our cities livable and all our cities centers of manufacturing and services. Today, for example, the agricultural GDP of contribution to GDP is merely 15%. 85% comes from manufacturing and services. So the jobs are going to create, be created in the cities. Now, the answer is how these smaller centers can create jobs. So if manufacturing and services moves to them, if intercity infrastructure is put into place so that these cities can serve as satellites in the way of the big cities and themselves become centers of some niche product manufacture clusters, I think this is how it will have to be nourished. But in India, unlike China, government has less role. In the sense, government has not created the third tier of, of, of governance. All the governance is central government and now states. And even the states had limited power under central planning. But local self-governments did not fully exist. There were municipalities run by state governments. So that is another problem that we have to overcome, allowing these cities to look after themselves and getting direct funding as their share of taxation so that they can start looking at themselves and say how they will grow. Mm -hmm. So it's a whole complex things that will have to happen. The only assurances are two, that this migration is happening as we speak. The speed is such that you will need all kinds of ways of trying to improve the cities even create five, 600 new cities in small villages or small towns close to agricultural areas can become very big cities based on agricultural processing industry. Mm -hmm. So there are many such possibilities if the infrastructure is built to and from the cities to other cities mm -hmm. and to the ports of the land. Mm -hmm. land. And it's interesting that this uh, theme that you have brought up about uh, secondary cities being empowered through devolution and grants yes. to invest in their own infrastructure and right. is actually a trend not just in emerging markets and developing countries, but in fact in the West as well. Yes. This is what we see happening in England and in Italy, yes. uh, in fact. So all of you have talked about the need for greater connectivity within the country among cities, connecting the satellite cities, as you called it, or the secondary cities, to the main centers. What is also interesting is the ability of secondary cities to reach beyond their borders, to connect internationally, to attract investment and supply chains and so forth. Um, Bangalore may be a very good example in India, uh, a place like Surabaya in Indonesia, uh, many cities in China uh, really do have their own international operations and connections today. So, uh, Mayor Denny, can you talk to us a bit about your international strategy? Uh, because you have made a great case for why Makassar is geographically and logistically so central in Indonesia, but you can also be an attractive international destination yeah. as well. <clears throat> Now we have uh, the focus focusing uh, to connect the international uh, uh, for the smart city system. Yeah. Now uh, everybody in uh, Indonesia uh, knows Makassar is the <coughs> smart city, yeah. And because uh, our positioning is very very uh, sexy, yeah. Uh, Makassar is a hub of Eastern Indonesia. You know, Eastern Indonesia is the about the mining, about the fishery, about the uh, farming. Yeah, uh, 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 Eastern Indonesia is the the logistic, uh, the future logistic of Indonesia. Mm -hmm. And uh, every each uh, each region and uh, city, yeah, to Makassar. Yeah, and Makassar uh, 
uh, the hub of uh, education, the hub of uh, uh, tourism too. Yeah. This is uh, our, um, uh, our positioning. And now uh, we implement uh, the smart city system mm -hmm. and we can connect uh, anytime, anywhere in the world. And uh, I think in uh, uh, two, two, 2016, uh, our uh, uh, smart infrastructure is uh, finished. Mm -hmm. And uh, now um, we built uh, our uh, seaport, uh, then, and then uh, the airport, and then uh, the toll road uh, infrastructure around the city. Mm -hmm. uh, 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 we, we want to make uh, Makassar is, uh, can uh, uh, give the services about the Eastern Indonesia. Mm -hmm. um, Ajit, you know, following up on uh, the, this idea of connectivity in the secondary cities, one of the interesting things about India is you mentioned that the agricultural share of GDP is only 12%, uh, 15%. Services are the overwhelming share, and we've seen the highest value added coming from those digitally connected sectors like technology. What are the next services hubs in India from the secondary cities, and how are you, uh, you know, what is the strategy to develop but, but them? To, but to create the kind of employment that we need to create, we are talking about 15 million new jobs every year. Mm -hmm. We're talking about a huge number of jobs. We will have to also have manufacturing in the country, mm -hmm. and for which a lot of policies have to change. But please understand one thing. Uh, one an extraordinary entrepreneur industrialist of India, Mr. Kirloskar, once asked me as a young man, Ajit, why don't you fly to, to Gorakhpur, a place in Uttar Pradesh? Mm -hmm. So I was perplexed. I said, why would I want to go there? He says, you don't fly there because there is no flight to Gorakhpur. <laughs> So it is important that we connect these smaller cities by air as well, so that people can live in those cities and, and participate in either services or manufacturing elsewhere, which today is not happening. You have to actually move to the big cities to be able to participate in the economy. So you need to now change this by creating this connectivity. Even internet speeds in Bombay are very different from when you go to a smaller place. So unless these, these things are rectified, the smaller towns will not get the sex appeal, as he said it, mm -hmm. in order to be able to be hubs of, of, of employment. Mm -hmm. And I think this is very important that we do that. Right. Um, Mr. Lee, you um, indicated in your comments that strategically the, the rate of growth of urbanization will slow down. So the question for China becomes, what is going to be the engine of job creation and of consumption when it comes to the populations of secondary cities as they are built and complete? Can you, can you comment uh, briefly on that? Uh, actually, the urbanization uh, rate in China uh, currently have uh, increased until 55% per year. So this is a very big number. Previously, from only 20 million, currently on already uh, reaching 26 million of urbanization. Uh, 
of course, actually, previously to suppress uh, the uh, progress of uh, urbanization, uh, we uh, use uh, industrialization. So we actually wanted to make more factories and industrialize a lot of the cities. However, currently, we're also uh, transitioning to a more services industry. So our services industry uh, uh, progress rate <coughs> is currently from 6% uh, almost becoming 10% uh, per year. 延续一下中国城市增长模式呢，我们可以看到，在中国，无论从中等城市还是大城市，基础设施、城市的面貌都非常好。当然，有非常严重的问题，就是服务性、服务业发展不足、城市的包容性存在很大的问题。Uh, currently, if we see the face of uh, the city, the cities in China, actually, whether it's a uh, small or medium-sized cities or so-called subsidiary cities, their infrastructure are already. Uh, uh, averagely very good, very good already. Infrastructure is actually not the problem. However, probably the challenges that we will face is more in the services industry. Uh, and probably since we have a, a special uh, land acquisition system in China, so uh, previously we actually developed the city through land acquisitions. Uh, however, probably other countries cannot adopt the same policies. However, uh, uh, although we are very, very successful in terms of land acquisitions and also infrastructure development, uh, but since uh, uh, everyone already know that the economic progress in China is very rapid, uh, hence, uh, because of this very rapid development, actually this is giving, giving a lot of the cities a lot of pressures because of the rapid development, for example, in the property. Uh, we, they are building property uh, properties uh, everywhere, uh, a lot of new landmarks, and this is giving a new pressures to the cities. Uh, hence, in the future, actually, uh, the problem that we'll be facing, uh, for example, is also including job opportunities. How do we create the job opportunities in these uh, subsidiary cities? Uh, a lot of, actually, the residents from the subsidiary cities are coming from the rural area and village area. Uh, but uh, currently, uh, the priorities of the new government will be to transform um, the industrialization to become service industry. So service industry is our main priority. Excellent. And uh, the second option is for developing cities in uh, China is actually the keywords will be innovation. How do we create city with uh, smart cities, uh, cities with uh, a lot of uh, innova innovation opportunities? So innovation is also a keyword. Thank you. We have time for maybe just one or maximum two questions uh, in the time we have left. Would, would, uh, are there any questions in the audience? Microphones? Are there any, any questions from the audience? Let me ask each of you, actually, in, since we have such little time left, what are the one or two secondary cities to watch in your countries, uh, besides your own, Mayor Denny, uh, <laughs> that, that people on the you know, outside don't really know enough about, but that we will be hearing about, and why? Just one or two. Uh, Ajit, let's start with you. Well, uh well, you, you can watch the new capital of the new state of Andhra Pradesh, mm -hmm. Amravati. You could watch uh, Indoor in Madhya Pradesh that would come up. Uh, you know, you, if you go back a few years, uh, the, the chief minister of Andhra Pradesh actually brought Andhra Pradesh into the global world. Mm 
-hmm. And so did Bangalore come into it. These, these had no mentors in that sense. Right. But they came in at the... So similarly now, with, with more power devolving around the states, mm -hmm. and there was one more thing. India was not a common market. Right. And as a result, there was no seamless movement of goods and services throughout the country. Mm -hmm. Now with the goods and services tax on a national level, it's becoming a common market. Mm -hmm. So you might, you might get surprised at some of the cities that we, we have not talked of just now, like Indore and others, mm -hmm. suddenly finding themselves as the next cities Excellent. to watch. Excellent. We'll skip over and we'll come to you at the very end, Mayor Denny. Uh, yeah. Mr. Lee in China. Uh, it's a difficult question because actually we have 570 uh, subsidiary cities in China which have a population between uh, 500,000 till 1 million. And, uh, and on the other hand, we also have uh, another cities of 20,000 cities which have a population of uh, 50,000 uh, uh, people. So we still have a lot of cities which have, which this uh, smaller cities can actually become the next subsidiary cities in China. Mm -hmm. So this is actually the challenges of the government. The increase of subsidiary cities in China will be very large. Uh, so, uh, actually, like in uh, China and India, because we have a massive population, uh, two of the world's most populous country. Uh, so, if we think like every day, how can we actually receive around 1,000 people coming into our city? Uh, for a lot of uh, the cities in, for example, in Europe, probably this is something that they cannot imagine. Uh, however, of course, for us, uh, you know, these smaller cities uh, or even the big cities, we have to provide them with opportunities. Mm -hmm. 最后一句话呢uh, hence, actually, because we have a million of uh, you know people coming down to big cities, uh, whether this is an opportunity or whether this is a challenge, and uh, how's the market condition uh, going to be created afterwards? So whether this is a challenge or opportunity, and how's the market condition? Actually, this is our homework for the next steps. Uh, how can we actually grasp the opportunity and uh, make it to a better uh, cities? And the final word to um, Mayor Denny, just. One city after Makassar to yeah. watch in Indonesia. I think it's uh, the same problem because uh, every year 100,000 people come to Makassar, students, yeah, mm -hmm. to uh, uh, study in Makassar. And uh, every day, uh, maybe uh, 500,000 people the hinterland area coming to Makassar to trader. This is a... Uh, 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 our problem, how to control the population. Because uh, 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 the urbanization coming, the pro pover poverty coming too. Mm -hmm. And uh, this is uh, the new problem. And every, every day, yeah, we have uh, um, uh, many, many problems from the urbanization. Mm -hmm. I think this is uh, uh, urbanization. Well, thank you so much to our panelists for shedding uh, a much-needed light on this uh, extremely important topic uh, within this uh, summit. We, we really appreciate your contributions, and I think that this began as a topic that was uh, neglected, and, and I think we're all enlightened and probably more optimistic about the fate of cities in the world hearing uh, from all of you. So uh, if everyone in the audience could join me in thanking our panelists. That concludes this session. Thank